Dusty Vision Radio from the legendary Groovatrons and the movie Breaking 2. Ladies and gentlemen, Ace Rock. What up, Ace Rock? Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining the show, man. No problem, no problem. I'm glad to do it, man. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's let's take it back. Um, man, you have a you have a um, a cool story. You're in one of my favorite movies of all time, but that's just. I was actually in two of the movies. Yeah, that's what two you were the in. Early movies. I oh, was in another movie called Body Rock. Exactly. Before I did uh, Break It Two. Uh, explain Body Rock real quick. Body Rock was a movie that was being filmed at the same time as Breaking One. Actually, Shabadoo, who did Breaking One, was offered Body Rock mm. in the beginning. And uh, something went down with Canon Films, and they decided they wanted a real actor to play the part. But then Breaking One came up, and uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Breaking, the series, Breaking and Breaking Two, are the only hip-hop movies, even to date, that have real street dancers as the lead actors. Mm -hmm. Even the movies now, they're making like Step Up 2 and all these other dance movies that come out. It's always, you know, it's always a story of, uh, I mean, Breaking had a similar, a similar uh, uh, vision of the story, but it's always like the white kid goes slumming in the neighborhood and, yep. <laughs> and gets a taste of the street dancers. And, and, that, and I refer to the, the part of Lucinda Dickey. Yeah. She was, a, you know, she was a regular dancer, trained dancer, and then she met Shabadoo. But anyway, long story short, they offered Shabadoo that part, and he took it. Now, Body Rock was, uh, they gave to Lorenzo Lama. I don't know oh, if you guys remember yes. anybody that's old enough to remember yes. him. Yeah. But, uh, and you know what, man? He tried, but he uh, he just didn't have any, any kind of, you know... Uh, dance uh, skills or anything or any knowledge of the street but you know that's what the studio wanted but the good thing about body rock it was a terrible movie that's but it, it shows a lot of true ogs in the game because w when we auditioned for that movie man there must have been like a hundred groups there auditioning okay. and in the end only four groups from la went and one group from new york made it to the movie the group from New York was the New York Breakers, who ended up becoming world famous. Uh -huh. wow. And the four groups from L.A. that were uh, that made it to the movie were the Electric Boogaloo, uh, the Blue City Strutters, and which later became the Blue City Crew, the Samoans from Carson, oh, okay. the Gruitrons, and yeah. then B-Boy Ozrock. And that was it. Oh, I'm sorry. One more group, the uh, L.A. City Rockers. And they were a locking group that out, of, out of L.A. who... Uh, Jazzy J actually went from LA City Rockers and then later on became an Electric Boogaloo also. Or down with the Electric Boogaloo, I should say. Okay. But that's a huge point in street dance history because, because uh, I mean, it had all of us in one, on one lot together. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so we were really looking forward to it that it was going to be, but we could see that, you know, that the actors are really struggling to, to create that kind of street uh, vibe as... The opposite happened with breaking. So, so body rock was good for people that were into the the dance already, but I don't think it appealed to anybody else. It didn't. It didn't do very well at the box office. But when breaking one came out, we knew there was going to be a sequel right away. Mm -hmm. And so when breaking two came out, uh, I actually was already uh, dancing with shrimp uh, in real life, and uh, it was real easy for us to just walk in. So. So a few of the Groovatrons and I walked right into Breaking Two with no problem. Nice, nice. Yeah, let's let's talk about that time, man. Actually, you know what? I wanna I wanna go back a little bit further. When did when did dancing into your life? Oh wow. Well, you know what? I can tell you, I started I started dancing in in around late 1979. But uh, I don't think I got any good at what I was doing to like the early 80s. I'd say like maybe 82, 83 at the best. Mm -hmm. But the first pe people that influenced me were the lockers. The lockers did it all. If you really look at it, the lockers are the beginning of street dance. They really are. They're the ones that put it on the map. Mm -hmm. Now, I know New York had its own thing going on, but we didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the West Coast. I, we're actually not really part, originally part of hip hop. And now it's all blended together, marriage together. I saw that marriage happen. I was part of that. But in the beginning, it was a total West Coast thing. Popping and locking. Or well, the first thing that I started doing was, 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 is what we first heard in my area. And there's people who will contest this, but we call it pop locking. That's the first thing I ever heard. I inherited a 
style of Compton pop locking that came to uh, Pomona, California by way of a man named uh, Nobo and Tyrone. Now, they were already dancing in Pomona. Okay. Well, let me back up a little bit more. Let me back up a little bit more. When I first started dancing, I was influenced by the lockers, mm -hmm. of course, locking and robotting. As a little time went on, we all saw Electric Boogaloo's on, on TV, mm -hmm. on Soul Train. Soul Train. We used to, Soul Train was a huge part of all of our lives. Yeah. And uh, we started dancing. I can uh, hear my I'm mom sorry. vacuuming now. <laughs> well, we started dancing uh, just around that time. You know what I mean? Or at least I did. Uh, like Pete was one of the youngest people in the Electric Boogaloo's, and he's still a few years older than me. So they were dancing before I did. Uh, I started catching on because it, it was all over. It was it was buzzing all over the street, and um, I I started dancing first in a city called La Puente, California. Yeah, buddy. I grew up as a I grew up as a kid there. Mm -hmm. Now I started getting influenced by other good people, such as who became like Dr. Cosmo, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. He was a big name around there. Another guy named Tic Tac. Uh, we used to go to like roller skating rinks, uh, anywhere where they would throw a, a, a dance with pop music. And at that time, pop music was uh, funk. It was zap. It was cameo. It was anything like that. So anywhere they had those type of dances, and it was usually the flyer parties or, or uh, even at the mall. We would go and battle at the mall. You know, we were young, mm -hmm. 13, 14 uh, years old, and that's that's how how it all started. I just happened to get better mm -hmm. and better and uh, get influenced by by other things as the dance started to change over the years. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Claremont, California, which is right next to Pomona. Yeah, and got uh, I got my first uh, eye on a guy. The first person I actually met in there was a guy named Dollar Bill, okay. who was actually from the Heartbreakers. I soon found out that in Pomona there was a great rivalry of North Pomona, which was the Heartbreakers, and No Bone Tyrone and a guy called uh, Patrick Teal, they know a Slick Dog, mm -hmm. and versus South Pomona which was this group called the Groovatrons, already existing. Okay. They were already building a legend there. Daryl Stokes, Dr. Doom, um, uh, Pop and Playboy, The Board Man, Stretch, uh, Lady Tick Tuck, Tick Tut, and uh, now she raps under the name of, uh, she's a rapper, underground rapper of uh, Medusa. They were changing hands uh, and doing things down there, and they were creating a, a wave style that, that has become legendary in in Pomona. So the first person I saw was Dr. Bill, I mean uh, Dollar Bill, and I was in about maybe uh, eighth grade going into high school, and uh, he must have heard about me because he came over to our school to battle me. And uh, at that time, it was the very, very beginning of, uh, of breaking mm -hmm. that we were getting from, from New York. When, when that hit, you know, uh, when Wild Style and... Um, and what's the other more like a documentary called uh, Star Wars? Oh yeah, Star Wars. When those two things hit the TV, I mean, it influenced everybody. So everybody on the West Coast was trying to learn how to break, and uh, it kind of blended with the, with our culture a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, what ended up happening was me and Dollar Bill battled each other, and we became friends, and we started, uh, you know, practicing together. But uh, somehow or another. I ended up going to different uh, gigs out there, different dances in Pomona, and I got turned on to the Groovitrons, and they actually asked me to start practicing with them. So I used to take, uh, I used to drive a moped during that time. Nice. <laughs> so I used to drive a moped down to South Pomona, the projects, and start practicing <laughs> with Doom and Stokes, and uh, and I was really influenced by by them, and I ended up getting into the group. And uh, from that from that point on, man, uh, that's when uh, that's way before the opportunities too. Mm. I mean, this is before. Hollywood even really got a hold of it. Mm. Once Hollywood got a hold of it, then it blew up. Yeah, bigger than than just the hood. Yeah. But before that, it was strictly a, a black and Mexican thing because it was it was strictly in the hood, and uh, and even the style was different. That's why a lot of times when you see me get down or when I try to go judge events, I try to dress a little bit back in the old school with the baggies and the long sleeves and the derbies and mm -hmm. and the white gloves and the shiny shoes. That's all a West Coast thing. Mm -hmm. Once we got influenced by breaking, it changed things. It started to change, and there became this little marriage between West Coast uh, street dance and this thing that was coming out of the Bronx called hip-hop. Mm -hmm. And so that came in like a storm. 
everybody was trying to break. Mm-hmm. Every pop locker, every popper, every boogaloo, every, everybody on the West Coast was trying to do it. Everybody on the West Coast was trying to do it. And I actually got good at both for a minute. And during that time, every popping group needed at least one break dancer or one breaker in their group. Uh-huh. And uh, and that's how kind of how I fit into the Groovy Tribe. Nice. How did you... After, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you no go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say after that is when some of the opportunities started coming up. That was going to be the and, next thing. Yeah, well, during that time, I would say it's like uh 80, 83 by this time when i got into the groove challenge it was uh, late 83 and they were talking we started to see different uh opportunities like in music videos for example stokes and shrimp uh-huh. were in party train uh-huh. from the gap band a lot of people don't know that no shit okay i know, Boogie, yeah, was, I know back- shrimp was in uh lionel richie's video also i think right Right, he was in a lot of Richie's, and that's because he got hooked up with Shabadoo, mm. and Shabadoo picked uh, him, Poppin' Taco, and uh, and uh, Ana Sanchez, oh, yes. who used Ooh. to lock with the lockers before. Oh, I had a crush And on then that. they even picked, <laughs> yeah, well, they picked all of those guys up, and Shabadoo's actually the one that hooked them up with Lionel Richie. That was all Shabadoo's connection. Oh, okay. Actually, Shabadoo should be credited a lot, man, because... It was really all of his collections that helped open up this door for all of all of the for breakers and and poppers. Really? And and yes. Look at way back then there was a documentary that they made called Breaking and Entering. Yes. And you can find that on YouTube now. I see was in that was back that is back in nineteen eighty three. If yeah. you look in there, you'll see Ice T mm-hmm. as part of the radio crew. Mm-hmm. Well, we were all Radiotron uh regulars, man. That was an actual real club. Mm-hmm. Yep. That club existed. Yeah, I had that Boogaloo was the on the show. What's that? I've had Boogaloo Shrimp on my show before. It was a great interview. Oh, he told you the same oh, thing, right? Man. Yeah, dude, yeah. But it was just called See, Radio, right? It wasn't called Radio Tron. It was, right. It wasn't called Radio Tron until the breaking movie. Yeah. And I'll give you the rundown on that. It, your, shrimp is right. It was called Radio, mm-hmm. Club Radio. And uh, Ice-T uh, and the Glove. Chris the Glove, he had with, him on too. Yeah, he told me about that too. Yep. But keep going, yeah. They, no, I was part of that, bro. I Dude, was there since crazy. 82. crazy. No shit. I was in there since 82. When I seen, I mean, when the glove was just building a crowd there, I was in yeah. there. That's how early I went there. So that was the epicenter. So so really, anybody that was any good back in those days, you had to go to club radio. Mm-hmm. You had to. So that's who you know. You would see Shrimp. You would see me. You would see Stokes. You would see some of the EBs. You, everybody ended up there. Mm. And then as Breaking got into it, even it just blew the doors down even more. So now you have B boys and pop lockers and poppers there. Mm. So it was crazy. That was really the epicenter of where West Coast hip hop started. And this is way, way before six in the morning. Mm. And this is way years before NWA. Damn, that's crazy. Uh, Glove told yeah, us a, the, Glove told us a crazy story about Madonna coming and and jumping yeah. on stage and and filling up Ice T while he was rapping. And I was just like, damn, <laughs> what a scene that, that actually must happened. Have been. Oh my god. You know what? I wasn't there, but there was a lot of credible people that were, yeah. and I remember when that happened, there was a big buzz about it, Damn. and uh, and a lot of people started. And that actually opened up the door for other people too, because other people that that didn't really look like you know street people, mm-hmm. they were more Hollywoodish people. Hollywood was filled with a lot of like punk rockers and yeah. all kinds of different, you know, diff. Every Hollywood's got a taste of everybody. Mm-hmm. People like that started coming to the thing too, mm-hmm. to uh, the radio, but. Uh, what happened with us is uh, we were at a group. We were at a dance at a place called uh, Florentine Gardens. Yeah. Oh, man. oh my Boulevard. God! Everybody from the '90s remembers that. I'm 41, right. so I'm I remember the Florentine Gardens, dog. That was big. It was Damn. big. That was, that was a badass place back in the day, and uh, there was some circles going on and some battles going on, and that was typical for us back in that day. That's uh-huh. how we got down. And there were some people in suits uh, checking us out, and after the battle. These guys in suits came over and handed us cards, and they says, "Hey, man, we're uh, we're gonna make this movie on uh, on uh, hip hop and breaking. You know, if you guys are interested to audition, come." And we we thought, "Yeah, right." So, we, but we kept the cards. Mm-hmm. Well, we called the cards, and it was legit, and that's how we got to the Body Rock audition. Now, when we got there, we saw so many groups and a lot of people that we knew and and people we'd never saw before. I mean, it was like I said, it's like it seemed like there was a hundred groups wrapped around the entire building. It was mm-hmm. over on. Sunset and Gower, somewhere mm-hmm. in that area. Okay, yep. Mm-hmm. In Hollywood. I remember. And uh, then we had a call back. We made it. And then there was a second call back. And there was like 20 groups. And uh, next thing you know, we got a call. 
We had a call that we made it. We actually got hired on as featured dancers for Body Rock in the beginning. And uh, and then when we weren't uh, dancing and getting paid uh, as dancers, we stuck around and became extras, mm. which was which was cool. Now for and it was all cash. That was cool because I was only fifteen and a half going on sixteen, and I was lying to them that I was eighteen. So cash was all oh, good with me. Nice, <laughs> not the cash a check or anything. Yeah. <laughs> no, That's it was all shit. a cash deal. So I mean, what fifteen, sixteen year old isn't gonna love that? Man. You know, you're filming a movie. You're sitting there eating, uh, you know, uh, catered, oh, yeah, food catered food and rubbing out with some stars yeah. and, and then getting into clubs that you shouldn't even have been in. That's I used to go with shrimp after that, and we would go to uh, different clubs around the, in Hollywood and different, all over L.A., and uh, and there was a buzz. You know, shrimp had the – shrimp became a celebrity after breaking oh, yeah. one. Oh, yeah. So he and I used to go to different clubs together, uh, Maryland's and Pasadena, Florentine Gardens. Uh, we used to go down to uh, – <laughs> What was it, Skateland? Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, Skateland. What, what city is that in? Is that Compton? I think so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we went everywhere, man. That, yeah. And, uh, but Shrimp was always, in, you know, uh, had the entrance on the side door. We, we we never had to stand in line back in those days. It was amazing. Then there was this one club, too, in um, Hollywood off of Melrose. I'll never forget. And that was called the Rhythm Lounge. Okay. And that's where the older cats hung out, where Shabadoo. Yeah, everybody in here is like, yeah, I remember every, every club you're mentioning, we're like, damn, that's crazy. Yeah, I remember that spot. Keep going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rhythm Lounge is, uh, I remember the first time I walked in there, Shabadoo was battling uh, Tom Sanchez in a circle. And there was all the electric boogaloos there. There was all the LA City rockers there. And, and I was 16 years old and got led into a 21 year old club that they actually carted and had a bar i tripped out Damn. only because i had this ghetto celebrity thing going on because of you know being in, the, in those uh in that scene and being in that elite crowd so i was pretty lucky i was pretty lucky that Damn. that happened but what rhythm lounge rhythm lounge actually was like the best of the best that's where everybody you know and that was kind of run by, and and by, by shabadoo Damn. Okay. getting back to shabadoo and his connections getting back to that breaking and entering shabadoo defected from the, the lockers he went out on his own mm. and he actually became the most successful locker out of all the groups the only one that was uh as successful as shabadoo for a minute was uh penguin who who we all know as rerun i, I do that was that's i was just about to say i thought it was rerun but yeah his name was penguin his name was uh-huh. penguin because he was a locker before they auditioned for uh what's happening uh-huh. i don't know if you guys yeah, knew that of course, or not. definitely he was on soul train all that right yeah Right, right. Uh-huh. And then, you know, he got the lockers on the show a couple of times. He would times, even incorporate that. Yeah, he would incorporate that into the show, I remember. Right. Yeah, when he could, anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, after that, after that, uh, the lockers continued, and then they kind of split up. And Shabadoo, uh, Shabadoo started his own thing. And he was the only one that act- was actually back on Soul Train as a dancer. And there's uh, this video of that, you know, as Shabadoo. And he had two other dancers. He had a, I don't know what the third, second dancer, I mean, the third dance guy was, but I know Puppet Boozer, who was an electric boogaloo, danced with him on, on uh, Soul Train a few times and other gigs, too. Okay. But so Shabadoo started getting a, a, bit, a bigger name in, within the industry. And Shabadoo's actually the one who hooked up that documentary, Breaking and Entering. That was a German documentary. Okay. From that basis, when it started to blow up now, we're creeping into like 84, when the when the movie, when Hollywood started to take notice, started seeing, you know, different street dancers and different music videos, and uh, Shabadoo hooking up with um, Lana Richie, mm-hmm. he went on a tour. He took Shrimp and Taco and Ana Sanchez with him, you know, through a world tour with Lana Richie. Lana mm-hmm. Richie was huge back then. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's how the offers came for the movies. Ah. Shabadoo actually helped open the door for everybody. Is he the one that helped you get on to break into? Well, in a sense, yes, because I mean, not directly, but but without him opening up those doors, we would have never had those opportunities. Mm-hmm. Just or getting that, mm-hmm. we became closer friends when we when we did uh, uh, break into. Okay. But Shabadoo's, you know, Shabadoo's from a different. Shabadoo's older than me. He's from the, you know, he started locking in. Uh, on uh, Soul Train in 71. Damn. You know, I was a toddler. I was a couple yeah. years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I used to watch it, you know, as far back as I can remember. But, uh, but yeah, they were they were my influence, man, in the beginning. Yeah. For sure. 
what was it like being on the set of Breaking 2? You know what, bro? To be honest with you, man, that was one of the happiest times of my life. I because bet. It looked fun, dog. It Aside was fun. The and, you know, that you guys had to wear, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You look back at it now, and it's, it is funny. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it was a kid's movie, in number one, you know, Ooh, also. Yeah. And so you no, look back classic. at it now, and it seems a little corny sometimes with different things, yeah. but... And the way we dressed was totally. Uh, but you know what? That was kind of in the, at the in the eighties, mm -hmm. man. The bright. I'm stuff. telling you. What, what the scenes, whole breaking? What, what scenes? Sorry. What scenes could we find you in just in that movie? Because we we're just playing video in the back while you're talking. Oh man, shoot! I'm all over that video. Uh -oh. uh, probably one of the best scenes is probably when the tractors come. Ah. Uh, and I'm on the tractor with Shabadoo. That's, that's you. Okay, on the tractor. Yeah. Type in breaking. Uh, all the radio tron scenes. I'm in. Uh, the court scenes, I'm right there next to Shab. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, I'm one of the people that helped carry shrimp away. And, yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, can we had some dance scenes. Can, can I bust something for you real quick? Can you what? Can I bust something for you real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Kelly K, won't you come this way? I'm going to take you to a place where we all stay. I'm going to take you to a place where we all go. And we call this place the Miracle, where I'm in my Ozone and Turbo T wet, a combination that can't be beat. So come on, everybody. Everybody come along with the TKO crew because they know what to do. We're going to all take a walk on the avenue. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, ladies I'm in that scene. I'm in that scene, too. We are you start really? Running down the, yeah. That's looked, my uh... favorite scene of all time, dude. That's funny. When we were running down the street and the low riders and uh, and that hill in East LA, yeah, I was right there, man. That's funny, yo. I, they sent me with yeah. some turquoise pants and I actually had a shirt, uh, a black shirt that had Ace Rock in, in turquoise letters across my chest. Uh, on really? The left side. We're watching yeah. you on the tractor right now. That's crazy. I know. That's funny. Oh, such a good movie, man. You know, like you said, it is a bit corny, but it still it gives you a great feeling when you watch it, dude. Well, you know what, man? It's, it's become a classic, yeah. you know, and uh, and really. I, I really truly believe this too. It that movie, especially that one and and Beach Street mm -hmm. out of New York. If those two movies wouldn't have exi existed and been sent overseas, this whole what we're calling art form now, mm -hmm. what back in my day we called just street dancing, yeah. has become an art form. Would have died. It really would have because mm -hmm. I'm telling you guys, in 1985 the scene was dead, bro. Mm. A year later, after we made those really? movies, maybe creeping into 86 a little bit, oh. there was no scene anymore. It died. Damn. We used to go to Florentine Gardens and, and start, you know, it's in you. It's just part of you to want to get down as soon as you hear a good song yeah. and try to start a circle, and circles would not start. Did it become I remember, corny? Like, or what was well, it became, especially like around, you know, when you're, you're in front of the street and you mm -hmm. hear girls or somebody in the background say, man, is he still doing that old stuff? Uh, you know what I mean? No. That's what it became. Ah, oh, that sucks. And I stopped dancing. Mm. I stopped dancing. Mm. I stopped dancing. I said, oh, no, I'm not doing that no more. Damn. And then uh, the whole gangster lifestyle that exists in L.A., it just swept me and a bunch of people up like a wave of the ocean. How old were you it's around that problem. time when you gave it up and then the, the streets started calling? Yeah. What, what, how old, was how old, yeah, oh, how old were you, Brent? When 16, 16, going on 16, 17. Damn. Oh, damn. What an age. Fuck. Okay. So you're 16 yep. and... and what uh, if you don't want to give the hood? It's okay, but what uh, what city or whereabouts was the hood that you you grew up in? If you want to give it, well, like I said, I grew up in in La Puente, so yeah. I was surrounded by it in there. But during the time that breaking and popping were popular, it quieted down a lot of it. A lot of it slowed down. A lot, it was, I mean, because a lot of gang members became pop lockers, yeah. or became b boys, you know. Mm -hmm. But when the scene died, and it wasn't that that uh, thing to go to, yeah, people you know, picked up the streets. Uh, yeah, and the you know, there's always that influence, and LA is full of gang culture, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and my family was in, you know, I had family that was involved, and, and it was just I was surrounded by it. Yeah. And so, you were, so you were yeah. in and out of prison for 13 years. After that, yeah. Yeah. After that, I started going to jail in 1986, mm. and from that point on to 1998, mm. I was in and out of jails and prisons. What was the longest stretch? You know what? You, the, you know what? The I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say it again. No, so what was the longest stretch you did? Uh, six years at one time, but, oh. but, but um, I never was out for more than 90 days. Wow. Before and within that 13 years, I mean, we're talking mm. in the beginning, it was, it was, uh, county jail time, which is actually worse. You go to prison, the, the, the game changes, but you live better, mm -hmm. but you're no longer, and you can, you can gangbang and get beat up in county jail. But when you go to prison, 
you mess up the, the rules change all together and and it's going from like you know the minor leagues to the major leagues and you know there's a whole new set of rules in there and, and the, you mess up in there you truly messed up what was the which charge? i never did what was the charge the last time was attempted murder Ugh. and uh i fought a life sentence in uh, 1992 okay and uh and it was my second term i'd already been in prison already i was out for like three months and i picked up a uh an attempted murder. There was a sticking in uh, in the Riverside area, Oof. and I was guilty. I was guilty, and uh, basically, without getting into details of involving other people, but I, yeah. I raised my hand to take care of something that that I shouldn't have, yeah. and got involved. And uh, so, me and a friend went out and did what we had to do. And uh, the guy that was hit was also on parole, yeah. so. <clears throat> So uh, he decided he didn't want to testify, and it got dropped down to assault with a deadly weapon, and that's what I was in until '98. For. Oh, okay. So that's so my conviction is actually assault with a deadly weapon, but gotcha. I was originally busted for attempted that's, murder. Damn. And after that, I made a decision. You know, uh, I was already married. Mm -hmm. I was going to my third kid, okay. and my wife had been through, uh, you know, waiting for me through all these uh, last past two prison terms, and I had to make a decision, man. Was I going to be a father and a husband, or was I going to make this a career? Mm. and uh so i got out <coughs> and so I, I mentioned to you before that i started going to church mm -hmm. yeah Victor and Alves. uh right but that wasn't until like close to maybe 2000 2001 i had been there before mm -hmm. but uh never through the home can i explain and, victory outreach to people who don't know what it is yeah go ahead because my stepfather went there for years he was an ex-banger mm -hmm. and you know everything did everything under the sun and he ended up there and it's a it's a church where you've probably seen them in your local city it's it's a, you'll see a bunch of ex like cholo looking dudes just hanging out in the front mm -hmm. um, but dude if you talk to these guys they're the most positive people because they've been through a lot of crazy shit well that's what actually influenced me to be honest with you because yeah. i actually grew up you know in and out of church when i was a kid so i had a little bit of of it already embedded in me mm -hmm. but you know when you're out doing bad you know you don't think about that until the only time you really think about it is until you get caught mm -hmm. or you're in trouble or you know i've been shot seven different times i've been stabbed 10 different times Damn, last God. time i had my liver yeah. cut in half oh yeah oh, oh yeah two pocket two pocket and 50 ain't got nothing on me <laughs> homie i lived it i lived yeah. it you can laugh and about they that. weren't from oh. prison they were all in the street yeah mm. all street fights and and got jumped and you know beat up a few people and then got the whole the whole car load over me and uh, oh, fighting off three, four guys and getting stabbed. And last mm. time I got stabbed eight times, God, eight man. times, and I was stuck uh, in the liver, lungs, kidney, and abdominal area. Oh my God, dude! And uh, I was in the hospital for a few months that time, but God, God saved me. You know, wow. God spared me through all those things. So there must, there must have been a different calling in my life because Bigger I've known and had friends yeah. that that took one stab wound or one yeah. bullet wound and and they passed yeah and uh here i was shot seven times and stabbed ten times two different mm. occasions the first time i was stuck twice in a gang fight mm. in montclair california and then the second time was over in uh, uh, next to la puente mm. uh in a uh, in a neighboring town there and uh, got into it with some guys there and, and that's what happened but but anyhow, yeah. When I when I when I was in prison, I remember uh, ministries coming to visit the inmates, and I always wanted to go and check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, never wanted to be a jailhouse Christian. I couldn't do that, but I did want to hear the word a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would go, and then I would get all pissed off because I would think, "What is this white boy from Oklahoma going to tell me about gangs and drugs?" <laughs> that was my mentality back then, you know. <laughs> so, so it wasn't until I got out, and you know, I started. I started doing bad, even though I wasn't going back to prison. I was still, I was working, and but I was still getting loaded and drinking, and mm -hmm. started drugging and doing all, you know, the wrong things. Yeah. And uh, and knew that I had to slow down. But it wasn't until I saw a person from Victor Outreach where I could tell this pastor was a true uh, gangster mm. at one time because okay. he looked it. Okay. No matter that he was a, a man of God, you know, at, at the point where yeah. I met him. Oh, these dudes. You yeah. could still see it in him. You still see it. Still see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his mannerisms and everything. I mean, mm -hmm. he was the type of guy that you would love to do time with, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he actually uh, really impressed me because uh, I remember I would go like on a Sunday, and then the next Friday night after work I'd be drunk and and missing an action again. And and he would follow up. He'd call the house. Hey man, where's uh, where's Robert at? 
And uh, my wife would say, well, I don't know. He didn't come home, so he's probably loaded somewhere. Damn. And he actually went out looking for me, man, at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. He asked my wife, do you know where he picks up at? Wow. And, and, and when I heard that, I was like, whoa. This is some you movie know? shit. This is like some Edward James Olsen yeah. shit. Yeah, exactly. Damn. So he, he talked me into coming back to church, you know, and, uh, and <clears throat> of course, I was sitting in the back. I wouldn't clap at the fellowship. I mean, I was hard. I wouldn't hug nobody. Mm -hmm. To me, the people that were trying to, you know, greet me in the church were too happy. Right. <laughs> you know, that's how hard and institutionalized I was already. And don't even bother trying to hug my wife. You know, I would push them away. Damn. And uh, I was really hard. But something mm -hmm. kept pulling me back. I would hear the sermons. And after a while, I would tell my wife, hey, are you telling the pastor what's going on in our house, man? Because every time I come to church now... You feel like he's talking <laughs> to you? Like, <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, I would hear that. Yeah. She was, no, I'm not. And, and, and really what I realized later on, what it was, the Holy Spirit was hitting yeah. And then there was that one time that I was in there, man, and I broke. Mm. I broke. And I, and I wept hard, okay. hard. And I knew something had happened to me. Mm. And so... Uh, so then I started, I agreed to go to the home and get clean, and I got plugged in, and I mean, you know, I wasn't a saint all the time, I was a real hard case, but uh, but I continue to endure, and, and I still do to this day, Damn. and uh, and that's what actually has kept me uh, out of the joint and walking the straight and narrow since, since way back then. I love that shit, dude, I love hearing that. <clears throat> now, am I, am I, am I tripping, or it, was the Duke of Earl movie related to Victory Outreach? Yes. It was, right? Duke of Earl. And they had a Duke play. Had... There was a play. I remember I went to see a play and I went to see the movie. First, there was a play. Okay. And Victor yeah. Outreach got uh, popular been doing those things, which they still mm -hmm. do now. Yeah. It Different was... pastors. Like, like I'm real close to a uh, to an evangelist right now. He's become a real good friend of mine uh, named Art Blavos. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you ever want to look him up. He's an ex Art what? Mafia. Art Blavos. Okay. I'm going to look him up. Thank you. He is a ex Mexican mafia hitman who got saved in like seventy nine and got out of jail and has been preaching and went under the victory outreach banner ever since. Never never told on nobody, never ratted, never he didn't become any of that. He just trusted God. And he was marked for life. He was supposed to be killed, you know, because mm. in, in the in the old school Mexican mafia he didn't do that. Mm. And uh and uh but God has been protecting him all this time and can he's you spell his, can today. you spell his last name for me? B L A J O S. B L A J O S. Cool. We're just pulling them up. Art La. B L A J O S. Perfect. Thank you, man. Go ahead. Continue. Anyway, uh, he and I have become a good friend. Yeah, He's it. an evangelist that's underneath. Oh, I recognize uh, him. Battle. I recognize his face. I definitely yeah. recognize his face. Yeah, he's a huge. Uh, been a, another oh, I huge. I would love uh, to talk to life. him. Oh my God, I would love to talk to him. Maybe we'll offline talk about maybe making a connection. I'll ask him. I'll okay. see what it, yeah, you we'll know. see. We never know, but yeah, go ahead. Keep. But anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, not to uh, not to uh, overplug the church, but yeah, that's no, no, that's I like that. It's it's a very important church, man. It's a very very important church. Um, well, you know what? Here's the difference. The reason why, because I actually used to go to uh, Calvary Chapel also, which I love their teaching. Oh, okay. I went to the one in Downey. That's so funny that you. I went to the OG one that Ralph Reese started in. Uh, when it was a uh, abandoned market oh, okay. in Baldwin Park, that's crazy. When man. he first started preaching, my aunt used to take me over there. Wow, what a small and that's world. when I was about seventeen, eighteen years old. She used mm. to drag me with her to to service. You know what I mean? Like I said, I would go, but but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't apply. Mm, right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, out the... But you know what though? That, that was all part of God's timing because because those words got implanted, you know, in your back of your brain and in your heart, and somewhere down the line, you know what I mean? It, it, yeah. it didn't go vain. But yeah. I, the reason why I chose to Victor Outreach to stick with them is because <clears throat> I like the focus on the people that they specialized on. Mm -hmm. They were the f one few church that I ever saw that focused on hardcore gang members, hardcore uh, uh, pintos, and that's Spanish for, you know, uh, convicts. Okay. You know what I mean? Drug addicts. Mm -hmm. they, they targeted them. Mm -hmm. Whereas to other churches, you know, Shut if you made it in there and you... Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would. I mean, Calvary Chapel never did, but they didn't mm -hmm. focus on that, you know. Gotcha. Uh, Calvary Chapel was more of a family-oriented church, mm -hmm. and uh, and if you happen to be an ex-gang member, cool. But mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't send people out to on a mission. Victory Outreach sent people to the drug dealing. I mean, yeah. to the epicenter of where it was happening, to the heart and soul of gang-infested areas. Yeah. Yeah. 
and they would come out there and talk. They would go out and talk to prostitutes. They would go out and talk to straight dopings, you know, straight hardcore bikers that the rest of society would never even want to be around. And I tripped on that because uh, the, the the very leader himself used to be a heroin addict, mm. and that's how he started Victory Outreach because he got pushed away from so many other churches. Mm. And uh, so I was like, wow. So when I started seeing that God could change people like uh, my first uh, my first mentor was my, a guy named Pastor Porky. He was that gangster I told you about. Uh, out of He was out of uh, San Diego, California. Okay. He started a church in Ontario, California. Mm. And that's where I met him. That was the home I went to in Ontario. Okay. But, and then he passed away uh, a few years after from uh, liver cancer. Mm. But, uh, but he was the one that, that went looking for me at 1, 2 in the morning that yeah. actually got me to, to come in. And just at the height of his church, man, when he was built, he built a church from nothing. His first church was, they sent him out there from San Diego because seven other pastors had failed in the city of Ontario. And uh, they sent him up there, they sent him up in a little uh, two-room apartment and told him, there's a barrio right there, with uh, Ontario's barrio. Damn. Go over there, they sell dope out of Sunkist. I and bet that's it was the around first Fourth place Street. he went. I bet it was around 4th Street. <laughs> Yeah, Sun <laughs> I know it was exactly where that is. Right near, right up the street from De Anza Park. Yeah, there's a little motel right there. Uh, actually, it was in the park. He went <laughs> in Sun Park where all the Black Angels yeah, from Ontario were kicking back and they were selling heroin, and he started preaching to them first. Yeah. And he said his first Bible study was in his living room, and three people were on a nod from heroin, but they were there. Wow, <laughs> no he didn't care, you know? Yeah. That's how he was. And from there... He built a church that was almost 300 strong, man. Damn. When we were, yeah, I, I got into the music ministry. I'm a drummer. Wow. Okay. So I've been playing drums since five years Remember, they years always had good music, too. That's what I remember. Yes, they do have. They have yeah, good worship. I remember that. I and, remember uh, that. and so, yeah, and then uh, his church started really growing. And then right at the height of it, man, uh, the old head C that he had in his liver oh, kicked in. God, it was so like good. the devil knew where to attack, you know. And uh, and it took him down. He got his liver <sighs> transplant, and he didn't make it Ugh, afterwards. God, damn, but uh, I got introduced to Art Blajos through him. Okay. And even though I felt a little lost after Pastor Porky split, you know, or passed away, mm -hmm. uh, Art Blajos kind of took over, and we have become friends and still keep in contact every week or two weeks. And they don't go farther than two weeks that we don't call each other or visit. Uh, I still go to California and visit. That's all true. the time That's but true. he flies all over the world so a lot of times you know i gotta make sure that he's in town because uh being an evangelist you, you know you do it you go all over but they have a play and he has a book about his life it's called blood in blood out you should check it out is it and is it, it involved me. with the movie not involved uh, not the no end. okay gotcha okay no the movie uh the movie is uh Bound actually, by honor. yeah right exactly right. Mm, yeah no his book was actually made before the movie but okay. it's a coincidence that it but it's so about to be yeah yeah, it's a uh, it's a similar story, but uh, oh. but arts ends up with a with a better ending. And know? that's probably with why a... they had to add "Bound by Honor" to their title because it was already taken. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. it could be. Damn. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's got a book about his. Uh, oh, I'm gonna about check that out. And, and, and there's a and play associated made... with that as well. Two Victory Outreach, right? Oh, that's just really like cool. they did Duke of Earl. Just yeah. like they did Duke of Earl. A lot of these famous pastors that have become famous because of their testimonies of who they were in the yeah. world, you know. And uh, they they make they they've made plays about their life. That's been one of the attracting things of Victor Outreach when yeah. they go out on a on a like a uh, a mission missionary or, or or like a campaign, you know, of a certain town, and they bring a, a testimony play. Yeah, okay. and the plays aren't real actors. The plays are people, oh, that, the go people to the that go to the church. Oh, I know, I right. know. And um, and there's but they're so yeah. real. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. And uh, and anyways, that's that's kind of what attracted me to it because I figured. Yeah, when I saw people like Pastor Porky or Art mm -hmm. Blahos, and I thought, if God can change them, especially for somebody like Art, mm -hmm. think about who Art was. Now, I was crazy, and I did time, and I did some 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 dirt. But that man was a step higher than me. I mean, he went to he was actually in the in the mafia, and a hitman for the mm -hmm. mafia. Now, if God could change him, there's got to be hope for me. Yeah. That's what I thought. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it was very encouraging for me to see because I saw that he wasn't fake he wasn't phony he was really out there reaching hardcore gang members and hardcore people that you know that needed that needed the lord man yeah. Yeah, and to me that's the only way anybody's ever going to change any any of those ways and and uh and give that lifestyle up completely is with the intervention of the lord
Yeah, damn. Ace Rock, thank you so much, man. It's been a true pleasure to have you on the show to share your story thank with you. us. And I, I know it's going to change at least one person out there, and that's what's important about doing things like that. Keep your name alive.